Okay, our next presenter hardly needs an introduction in Ashland, Oregon. Foster Gamble is the co-creator of the groundbreaking documentary film Thrive and its companion website thrivemovement.com. Thrive lifts the veil on what's really happening behind the scenes in our world, uncovering the global consolidation of power in nearly every aspect of human lives. And this film has been translated into over 20 languages, and Foster told me yesterday that they're up to 72 million views worldwide. Just unprecedented. Now, I have to say that, you know, back in, in 2011, when I started to see the trailers for Thrive, I was getting so anxious to see that and definitely showed up in my, my local uh, uh, viewing home because a lot of homes were showing the film on uh, November 11, 2011, and it just blew me away. I thought, wow, this has arrived, and this is going to have a huge impact. And my hat's really off to you, Foster. When I think of the term, a purpose-driven life, that is you. And, and the stage is yours. Thank you, John. Wow, I've been looking forward to this for a long time in so many ways. First of all, just it's such a an honor and a privilege to be able to have the attention of, of you guys for an hour um, and to be able to follow a couple of my genuine heroes and to precede the other ones who will be coming this afternoon. But I've been following all of these speakers for years. Um, so I'm even more interested in what you guys are thinking. And that's really, the, I'm not doing a lot of conferences right now because I'm involved in a lot of other stuff that I'll tell you about. Um, but I love this one, especially because Jordan and his team really understand that it's up to each one of us to architect the new paradigm. And so he's designed a format here that's really about honoring the genius of every single one of you. And the interaction that's going to be going on, the, the, the questions. So, so I'm, you know, I know what I know already. I'm really interested in hearing from you as the weekend goes on. So I inv we invite your absolutely full participation. And secondly, this is uh, a homecoming to Ashland is really special for me because um, as I drove into this hotel, you know, following my Waze GPS thing, I realized, oh, I recognize this place. The production of Thrive in 2004 began in this hotel. <laughs> and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Kimberly and I came up and we stayed here for a number of days and we, we met with uh, Stephen Gagne, our director of photography, who's from Ashland, uh, Ken Romney, who was the second camera and in charge of, of sound, who's from Ashland, uh, Goa Loba, who's our brilliant guy who created all the visual effects for Thrive, who's from Ashland. We, we recorded all the green screen narration, uh, special effects and so forth in uh, Landmine Studios uh, up in Medford. And Perhaps most of all, um, our major script advisor, kind of my major mentor uh, on the content of Thrive was my own son, Trevor, who was living in Ashland at the time. And as I was working on the, the content of Thrive, uh, he contacted me. He, he had told me three years earlier, he, he said, he said, Dad, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. He graduated from college. He said, but I need to figure out how the world works first before I decide where to put my energy. I thought, that, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, I said, great. So uh, let me know what you come up with. <laughs> Little did I know. Uh, he moved to Ashland, which happened to be very near that renowned den of iniquity called the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library. And I don't know if anyone took more stuff out of there than Trevor, but he established a relationship with Jordan and just started devouring stuff. Um, and then he started contacting me and he said, Dad, you know, before you really finish the script for that movie, he said, I think we need to talk. So uh, he came down to uh, where I live in, in Santa Cruz and uh, spent a couple of weeks. And 
he was teaching me about banking schemes. He was teaching me about conspiracy. Uh, and most importantly of all, he was teaching me about this thing called liberty, which is, as you're, you're seeing, it's way beyond like patriotism or we're the good guys or something like that. Um, and he and I had just respectful but really intense discussions, uh, arguments, uh, challenging each other uh, for day after day after day. And I really have tremendous respect for Trevor, and I think I'm still caught in kind of, you know, I've been around for so long, and I'm the father, and all this stuff. But pretty soon I started realizing I'm standing on ethical quicksand, and he's making a lot of sense. And finally, there, you know, um, Mary, uh, she was mentioning the aha moment. Well, I had the aha moment, uh, and so did Kimberly, with Trevor after weeks of, the, of this discussion where I finally went, okay, you know, the truth of the matter is I don't feel like I'm making a lot of sense. I don't feel consistent in my own worldview, and, I, and I'm scared. I don't know where this is going to lead. I feel like you're on to something, but everything I know is like, seems like it's behind me, and I'm standing on the edge of this cliff, and you're suggesting I just jump out into freedom. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know if I'm, if I'm going to sprout wings or I've got a parachute or, you know, what, what's going to happen. Uh, and so I really empathize with the challenge of getting that there's an alternative to the authoritarian state because we were indoctrinated since kindergarten that we had to have an authority ruling us. And it seems like if, if we don't, not only, you know, who's going to take care of the poor and the roads and the schools and the old and the sick and, and all those really genuine considerations, but who's going to protect me? But we've got, most of us have been around long enough to realize, that, you know, the government's not doing a super job of protecting us, much less the poor, the sick, or the roads. Uh, so, so maybe there's another alternative, and that's what I want to explore today. I really appreciate being able to, uh, to kind of water ski in the wake of Mary Ruart, who's been one of my heroes for years. I actually met her for the first time last night, and I was stunned. I thought she would be like six foot five. <laughs> because her stature, in my mind, is so great. She, she, I, I've studied Aikido for many years, and Mary, to me, is the Aikido master of communication about freedom. Because she just gently makes sense, asks questions, provides the evidence, and so forth. And all of a sudden, you're there. And it's like, whoa, what happened? Wait a minute. <laughs> There's no coercion involved in her communication. So um, I highly recommend, if you haven't already, that you get her books and read it. It will save you a lot of time and truly help set you free if you're caught in inconsistencies that aren't working for you. OK, so let's get started. Can we bring the slideshow up on the screens? Okay, oh, <laughs> there's a place to start. <laughs> so as Buckminster Fuller said, humanity is at a fork in the road, and we need to choose consciously between utopia or oblivion, paradise or oblivion. And I believe that we need to figure this out right now. We're at a unique point in human history. There's never been more risk to the planet and to all of humanity with the nuclear weapons, the biological, the, the chemical weapons. With, we're very quickly coming to the era where one pissed off person who got his family destroyed by some drone will have access to a dirty bomb that will take out a city. That's never happened before in history. We actually need to figure out how to get along and stop violating each other as quickly as possible. So a little update. I'm going to give you a little update on the Thrive Movement because what's, what's happening, what we're seeing in the world is so exciting. People are constantly saying to Kimberly and me, gosh, don't you get depressed with all the bad news you deal with? And I said, no, quite the opposite. The bad news is like you know, a doctor getting the information for a diagnosis about what's going on in your body, in this case, what's going on in the world, so that you can create solutions which are commensurate to the problem. 
and the solutions that we're seeing are so exciting and such a validation of who human beings really are in their souls that I, I, we can barely contain ourselves. So I, I'd love to get a chance to share it. A few things that have happened since Thrive came out. As Joel told you, we're over 72 million views, still over a million a month in 27 languages. Um, and that's considering one view per DVD or stream. And people are seeing it in groups, they're passing it around and so forth. It's probably more like 100 million. So to us, that's a real validation that people are hungry for uh, grounded information about what's really going on in the world, even if it's challenging, but especially to empower them to create the solutions. And one of the things that happened after Thrive came out is as we traveled around to over 50 cities around the world, we saw that there were self-creating Thrive-inspired solutions groups happening everywhere. So we realized also in meeting with some of them, they, they were commonly recreating the wheel. They were all doing the same research on GMOs or chemtrails or banking schemes or organic farming, whatever it was. And so we created a hub on our website called the Solutions Hub where they can uh, meet each other virtually where people who want to get involved in a group can find a group that's working on their issue anywhere in the world or they can find a group by zip code or by country uh, that they can, can join. These are independent groups. We don't micromanage uh, anything. The only requirements for them is that if they're going to be used sectors, uh, they use the same titles that 10 groups have come up with, over a, including Barbara Marks Hubbard and uh, Shift Network and others have come up with over a decade of, of all, all of us working together so that we can coordinate activities worldwide. And the other is that their solutions can't involve the creation of any new violations. So a bunch of people have come to us with you know, very well-intended ideas. They're going to need new taxes to do it. Sorry, that, that's not how the Thrive Movement operates. But it really is exciting to see the creativity that gets unleashed when they can't depend on taking somebody else's money to solve the, the problem. So there are now over 1,000 uh, solutions groups in close to 100 countries around the world. And they just kind of report in and they share resources, uh, best practices, and so forth. Uh, on our website. They're taking on, amongst them, they're taking on about 250 different issues, which could be really daunting and diluting, except that they're all autonomous, they're all doing it uh, voluntarily, and the, the common principle amongst them is, number one, no violation in the solutions, and number two, every single project is involved in recognizing that the problem is a breakdown in the wholeness of a natural system. As far as we can tell, always, whether it's the economy or the ecology or the justice system or whatever, uh, energy access, the problems are a breakdown in the wholeness of natural systems and therefore the solutions are being able to recognize that, know what a whole system would look like and then undergo the process without violating you know, either an ecosystem or individuals uh, go about restoring wholeness to that system. And that's what we're seeing that's so encouraging. So you, remember, you may remember this uh, animation from the movie where the vector equilibrium is the basis of our, uh, of our whole sector system. It covers all of the major sectors of human endeavor and then is centered, like Danny was talking about, by worldview because your worldview affects how you, uh, how you act in any of these sectors. The other thing that was so exciting that happened uh, after the movie was that we were contacted by uh, now over a thousand different uh, innovators and inventors from all over the world who had breakthrough projects that either already had been suppressed uh, or given the content of the breakthrough and given what they learned from watching Thrive, they were concerned that if they tried to bring it out on their own, they might be suppressed and usually with, with good reason. And so I've spent the last three and a half to four years, mostly vetting projects and studying liberty. And so what we have seen with these projects is so inspiring. We've got an encrypted database where we, we cut the 1,000 down to about 500 that are really serious projects. Some people will approach us, I had this great idea and I've been on my couch, but if I could have $2 million, I would, that, that's not, those aren't the ones we're working with yet. Um, we're working with the ones who actually are doing it anyway, even if it's on a shoestring. They've got a track record of effectiveness and integrity, and the project that they're working on can be scalable globally. Those are some of our, of our criteria. And this 
uh, chart is a two-dimensional version of our whole sector model. And the little beads next to the, uh, the sector titles, those, those sectors are things like uh, infrastructure and justice and media and relations and spirituality and arts and uh, education and so forth. These are, uh, we've narrowed it down to about the top 75 projects covering all sectors. Uh, and now we're actually actively working with the, uh, about half of those, about 35 of them, of them. We've turned into this cosmic dating service where we're, we're trying our best to, to hook up the innovators with the investors and philanthropists because, as you all know, it takes resources uh, to access the goods and services that, that Mary was talking about and actually manifest this stuff uh, in the world. So I want to give you some samples um, of the kinds of things that we're seeing. I'm going to do this without names in most cases, um, unless the person's very public already, uh, and without locations because these people are genuinely uh, under threat. Uh, how many people know about the mysterious, suspicious deaths of holistic doctors around the country? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately the word is that. It's over 60 now in the last 18 months. That's a war. Uh, and it's really serious. The, the security team that, that we work with um, has been taking that on and literally going kind of doctor by doctor and helping them secure their house, learn how to act in secure ways. If they go into particularly dicey situations, they're, they're getting uh, protection and really trying to keep these people uh, alive and well so that these things can get out to the world. For instance, uh, we're working with several doctors who are... Um, consistently, like literally over 90% uh, ending uh, terminal cancer. I'm, I didn't say that right. They're saving the lives of people with terminal cancer, uh, as well as chronic fatigue, MS, uh, ALS, uh, e EM uh, saturation, just all sorts of things. Um, and most of these doctors are offshore because it's simply too dangerous in the US. And I look forward to the day when that's not the case. Got another doctor who uh, has come up with a process for uh, extracting enzymes from organic uh, vegetables uh, in such a way that he can keep them absolutely 100% whole for a month. And he's created uh, a concoction which he's giving to diabetics which are freeing people from insulin, uh, type, type 1 and type 2 diabetes in two weeks. Uh, so obviously the implications of that are, are huge. There's another process, if you haven't heard of it yet, called hemolucent, and this is the one, by the way, Kimberly sends her love to all of you. She would have loved to have been here today, but she took off this morning for Costa Rica, uh, where she is, we did a soft launch a couple of months ago of this hemolucent technology down at a, a health center in Costa Rica. Uh, and this is a very exciting breakthrough technology where this guy that I've known for 20 years has created a, a way of basically creating technologically induced spontaneous remission. Um, people have never been able to really explain how spontaneous remission happens, but it looks like what's happening there is, it's, is something happens in someone's consciousness through prayer, meditation, luck, desperation, whatever it is, something clicks and all of a sudden things get cured. Well, things are happening with this technology, but what it's doing is really assisting people biologically by extracting a little blood, then centrifuging that, taking out the plasma, and you're left with this blood that has billions of um, the equivalent of day-old stem cells that are your own. And then you activate those with certain laser frequencies. This guy was contacted by the last remaining uh, survivor of Royal Rife's team. If you remember the guy, Royal Rife, who was curing cancer in the 40s and then got shut down uh, from Thrive. Uh, and so, so he has incorporated the Rife frequencies into an already effective technology. So you, you treat the blood, then you put it back in the body. Now it has 100 to 200 billion day-old stem cells. And then as it goes into your bloodstream, you take the same laser and aim it if you've got a rotator cuff problem, if you've got heart disease, if, if your pancreas is bad from diabetes or something like that, you aim the laser. It's a very gentle, like, like a, you know, it's like one of these. It's no more powerful than that. 
but it's the frequency is allowed to pass all the way through the body. So it, you can aim it at an organ anywhere in the body, and all those hundred billion cells will follow. They'll they'll seek out that beam, just like ducklings following the mother duck, and they'll go and literally adhere to that organ, that joint, whatever, and just start healing, and they're multiplying the whole time. So we're getting fabulous uh, results with everything from quadriplegics getting uh, their sensation back in, in their entire body and being you know, 30 to 50 percent stronger to people healing sports injuries. One of the former uh, world champion big wave surfers uh, hurt his ACL and uh, and he had a competition coming up in, in a month, and he was going to go in for surgery, but he heard about hemolucin, had the treatment, he was well in three weeks with no surgery, and surfed in the competition. So th there's a whole range I'd love to go into more, but, uh, but not right now. So that treatment is available at the Rhythmia Life Advancement Center in Costa Rica. It's the first medically licensed uh, health retreat for ayahuasca and other plant medicine uh, anywhere in the world. And they, they're very uh, conscious about how they take care of people, the environment is very medically uh, sound. Um, it's a great place to go just for a, a retreat, you know, yoga, massage, exercise, meditation. Uh, but you can also get the hemolucin treatments, you can do uh, plant medicine, uh, amazing place. And what we call this is hemolucin laser-guided blood enhancement. And you can find this if you go to, to uh, Thrive Health Access. Uh, just look that up on the, the internet and you get the information about that or go to rhythmia.com. Okay, more solutions in the energy area. By the way, if you don't know it, Ashland is a hotbed of brilliant young inventors uh, in energy, in uh, structuring of water and many other things. I would say uh, LA, Denver, uh, Ashland, and one area in Florida are, are the most uh, creative areas that I've seen succeeding in just fabulous new technologies coming out. So we're seeing uh, self-running magnetic motors. When it's self-running, that means it's over unity. It's just pulling energy from uh, the space around it. We've got another technology which boils water in eight seconds. Very inexpensive, just coils in a brilliant geometry. Boiling water, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that's what, that's what coal-fired power plants do. That's what nuclear power plants do. Those would be replaced by something clean, cheap, and safe. Radiant energy, battery charger. Unfortunately, that one was, uh, we were working with John Bedini uh, out of Idaho, who unfortunately died a mysterious death just a few months ago. Uh, his, he had been working forever with his brother, he was very close to who was dying of cancer. Uh, and then and his brother died and four hours later John died. Now maybe that was, you know, empathic connection, uh, but I'm also very suspicious uh, about those kinds of things because John uh, had over unity devices working. He never marketed any. He told me that uh, he, he said his life was threatened if he ever tried to actually sell one that was, was over unity. This is an example of, of uh, one of the devices that you saw in, uh, in Thrive where all of the devices that are working are working on some form of mimicking or honoring the resonating with the Taurus. In the environment, I just came back from uh, an incredibly exciting little summit meeting that I organized down in Mexico with three of the, I think, the leading scientists in the world, um, one of whom was, uh, was the guy who was behind Hemolucent. Uh, another one was Nassim Haramin, who's here this weekend. And the third one was the guy, I, I, I can't reveal his identity yet, but it, he's, uh, if not the most, he, he's among the, the most advanced scientists that I have ever met. Um, and he's a MD, he's a PhD in quantum physics, he's a mechanical engineer, and a biodynamic organic farmer. Wow. So he, he understands and loves nature and really honors it, and he's one of the ones uh, He's got the highest cancer cure rate that I know, but he, uh, he wants to pass on the knowledge. So he's now working with Nassim to, to pass on what he knows with, with the energy stuff. He's working with this other doctor uh, to pass on a lot of the medical stuff because he wants to be focused on the environment. He's so concerned from what he knows about the oceans 
that um, he wants to focus as much of his energy as he can there because he's actually got technology which is restoring full life to barren coral reefs in 60 days. Yeah, just amazing. And he, uh, he can decontaminate lakes uh, and rivers, so he, he's got a big project down in Mexico that he, he's got a lot of the permissions now from the politicians and the police down there because he's saved a lot of them. So they, they call him the ET. They can't figure out where that brain came from. But, uh, but they love him down there. And, uh, and there's a, another guy who's stepping forward now who has also been rescued by him medically who has access to tremendous funds, uh, enough to not only heal this bay, but if this experiment is successful, uh, on, the, on the level of an entire bay uh, to take it globally. So uh, we literally, this happened yesterday morning while I was here, um, and it's not totally confirmed. I can't reveal any of the identities or organizations, but this is you know, one of the top organizations in the world and some of the top minds, and plenty of money to actually do this. Uh, so we literally could be looking at the restoration of water worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> And I want you to know that along with that, the, uh, his other passion is agriculture. Uh, and he's got technology which is uh, not only restoring soil, but keeping uh, the uh, different blights out of orchards and out, out of fields uh, in totally natural organic ways. It has to do with nanoparticles and scalar fields that, that enhance the, the growing of the, of the fruits and vegetables and so forth, really restore the, the soil. Uh, all totally natural, and he's doing this in Mexico, and I don't know if you know, but Mexico just recently kicked Monsanto out. <laughs> so it's the perfect time to bring this technology. Uh, we also use this laser activation technology to enhance foliar organic sprays that go on and, and tremendously enhance the, the growth and nutrition of, of the plants. So this, the agriculture fits together with the environmental rescue because one of the major sources of the destruction of the reefs is the agricultural pesticides and herbicides and so forth that's going into the rivers, coming down into the bays. So they're literally going to be doing the agriculture, the water, and the reefs all together. It's super exciting. Wow. Yeah. And Boston, you know we did? We took Monsanto out of Jackson. I love that. Thank you for. <laughs> I, I did a, a blog on that. That was really exciting. So I mentioned coral reef restoration. His technology also seems to have the capability to neutralize uh, nuclear waste. So in, in terms of Fukushima, it's the, it's the most exciting thing I've seen so far. That has yet to be proven, but the tests that he's done are very promising. So I've mentioned this a little bit already, but what's the common denominator of these solutions? It's wholeness. It's always wholeness. Uh, Mary was talking about restoring uh, wholeness to, uh, to someone who had been, been victimized. That's the key everywhere. It's, uh, and the Taurus is the representation of that. And it's not just a symbol. It's actually how nature works. You know, your, your body, your physical body is a Taurus. You know, it's a continuous surface with a hole through it. Uh, your energy field is a Taurus. All, the sun, the, the solar system, the galaxy. The atoms, the subatomic particles, they're all this, it's the only pattern that self-sustains in the homogeneous medium, which, which cosmic energy is. So it really is the blueprint for all of this. And the reason I invited the, the Nassim and those other two uh, inventors, besides you know, wanting to get the money for their projects, is that any one of them on their own, when they explain their theory to the layperson or to traditional uh, academic scientists, sounds crazy, and I'm sure that Nassim will verify that. <laughs> I've been with him in a lot of meetings where he was treated as crazy. It's just that they're also right, uh, and they're proving it in their applications, from energy applications to agriculture, health, and so forth. And so I brought together a bunch of, of investors and philanthropists, and I wanted them to hear all three of those scientists describe how they think that allows them to produce the results they're doing, and it worked. It was so exciting, and we got all this on video. In fact, I'll take this moment to, uh, to say,
Kimberly and I talked about this this morning, and I want to announce, this is a little scary for me, but it's also very exciting, that the, the filming of this meeting that I'm just describing was the beginning of our commitment to Thrive 2 this evening. We don't have all the money for it yet, but we've got the intention, and, we're, and Thrive 2 will be about all of these solutions and the principles that cohere them. The, the title of the first movie was Thrive, What on Earth Will It Take? The working title of this one is Thrive 2. This is what it takes. <laughs> so this to me is a beautiful artistic representation of the nature of the quantum energy field. Danny was talking about some of the quantum principles this morning. This is where energy is going. It's where consciousness is going. It's where agriculture is going. Uh, because we live in this field, whatever you want to refer to it as, we live in this field of continuous energy. And if you understand how it's structured, because it is structured, it's structured in basic principles uh, by nature. If you understand how it's structured and the interface of consciousness and technology with that, then you can actually manipulate that field in very healthy ways. And one of these inventors has... Uh, has the ability to basically move biology forward or backward or pause it in time. And if he pauses it, then he, he can apply the materials that he makes out of this to the inside, for instance, of a freight car that's transporting fruits and vegetables. And they'll arrive there just the way they left. Uh, it lasts like 30 times longer. Uh, he's got another technology, uh, um, and these are some of the spin-offs that came out of the meeting we just had. Some people are taking these businesses on. Uh, where he's got these quantum chips that he's developed that he'll put on the outside of a, of a glass. You know, and you, he did these tests with us where you, you drink a little tequila, really bad tequila, and it tastes like gasoline. Then he puts this chip on, and you take it there for two and a half minutes. You taste it again, it tastes like top shelf, you know, Patron silver or whatever. Uh, and you can do the same thing with wine. So he's doing in less than three minutes with a, a, a passive uh, quantum manipulation, he's doing the equivalent of five to 10 years in a barrel. So that's when you're moving time forward, you're accelerating it. But the really big thing is when you, when you move it backward, not only can you take a piece of fruit that's desiccating and restore it to wholeness, completely blew my mind, but m most importantly, you can do that with human cells that are suffering from cancer, move them back to their condition of wholeness. So the quantum field and its understanding is a huge breakthrough for all of us and for the planet. And I think Nassim will be talking more about that later on. So why don't we have these solutions in the world? Well, two big reasons. One is lack of adequate funding. And there are a bunch of us who are working hard on that. And it's beginning to turn. And two, because it's being suppressed by those operating in an old, non-sustainable paradigm. The uh, two of the doctors that I was mentioning, uh, between them they've had uh, their files uh, stolen, their cultures stolen, five attempts on their lives. That's why they're living in foreign countries right now. Another uh, inventor is currently, well, just recently was under uh, overt uh, threats, harassment, uh, ELF bombardment to literally right, send me these pictures where his tongue was all swollen and every joint in his body was was hurting and the security team has helped to, uh, to, to stop that. But without it, he'd have just been suffering on his own. Uh, there, as you know, and we talked about in Thrive, and it continues, if people aren't careful, the raids on these energy labs, patents confiscated, lives threatened, gag orders issued. Now they're even, yeah, you, you probably know, they're raiding people for you know, raw milk. Uh, they're for catching rain on your roof uh, you know, as drinking water or for your garden. What's that? Even in Bedford. Yeah, yeah. And it's, unfortunately, it's all over the country. But it's waking people up to the violations of the state and just making it more obvious. OK, so uh, one of the things that I'm passionate about, and one of the reasons why I, I, why I love and admire Mary so much, um, is that we're really short on respectful conversations where we disagree whether it's scientific or political or social or, or whatever. And so I've been really trying to study that. And, and 
the way Mary does it so, so gently and, and clearly uh, is just like an Aikido lesson uh, for me. And so one of the things that, that I have learned in, in trying to communicate about liberty is to start where, with what we have in common. And, and that's with values. With everyone that I've talked to, usually, unless I'm really talking with a psychopath, which un unfortunately happens occasionally, doesn't last long, but um, they, we usually share probably 95% of our values. You know, we all want to live in a condition of honesty and freedom and fairness and compassion. We want people to have enough, enough food and water and shelter and health, security, education, electricity, clean environment, opportunity, prosperity. We want people to be experiencing love. And virtually everyone wants that. So why are we in such a polarized world? And I think to, to figure that out, we've got to go, how did a few people get the power to suppress all these inventions and to, to dominate our, our, uh, our economy and to, uh, to ruin our lives and debt our grandchildren in so many ways? So I spent a long time researching this and uh, finally felt like I was starting to get a handle on how this happened. So I want to try to, to condense a few years of research down into a very quick story for you. So once upon a time, when human beings were uh, living as hunter-gatherers, they were moving from place to place and, and in small communities, and you know it was a stressful life. Uh, and then a few people figured out that if they got some seeds and planted them and watered them and so forth, they could actually stay put. And then they could harvest a crop, they could save it through the winter, they could collect the seeds, and you know, they could actually stay put and choose a, a, a climate that was conducive. And you know, in a very simple terms, it was the beginning of civilization, where they actually had time to you know, think about philosophy and think about inventions and th not just survival every day. So, so they started into the agricultural era. But there were some people who didn't want to get their hands dirty that way anyway. And so they figured out that they could just go around and if they created some gangs uh, and got some weapons, they could go around and rob the food from the people who had grown it and saved it. So, uh, so they did that. And this was really, in a sense, the rise of the predatory class. And eventually, unfortunately, they found, you know, we're still having to move around, whereas these other people don't. And it's kind of dangerous to have to do this marauding all the time. So they, they, they still didn't want to do the work, but they, they figured, okay, if we can stay put uh, and convince these people just to, to keep giving us this stuff, that would be so much better. So I think probably what happened is, is some bunch of thugs came in, took, conquered an area, and then took a, uh, a bunch of tin and put it on, on the head of, of their leader and said to the people, this is your new, what we're going to call a king. And people go, what? And he's going to rule you. But more importantly, he's going to protect you from all these other bad marauders. So the first protection racket came into business. And... Uh, and then, you know, by the second or third generation, people just figured, you know, divine right to rule. Kings were in charge, uh, and, you know, kings or queens or, you know, princes were right up there and so forth, and you had these royal bloodlines and all that, and they started to accept it, you know. And, and still, you know, you look at what's going on in England, all these ceremonies with the queen, it's just mind-boggling that people could still be thinking that way. But... Um, Eventually, people did start to catch on. It wasn't so comfortable, so they started to rebel. And they, the royalty uh, you know, turned themselves into Caesars or dictators. Uh, and you know, with the crash of the Roman Empire, that, that came down. And so they had to take all their wealth and all their control and everything, put it into the, to the church. Uh, but people started catching on to you know, some of these claims of the priesthood and the dictators and so forth. So the big breakthrough was when the predatory class said, OK, We'll tell the people that we're just going to represent them and they'll be ruling. And so they invented democracy. And it was the shining light on the hill. And, you know, uh, it's come a long way from the pharaohs and the dictators to democracy. It's a hell of a good move. But still, at best, it's mob rule. 
So really, have we arrived there yet? Or are we actually still duped and conned and fooled and, as John Perkins would say, hoodwinked into giving our money and giving our power to the predatory class? And you look at the Bushes and Clintons and Brzezinski's and, and Kissinger's and Bolton's. Uh, you look at these people and you study their past and you realize, oh my God, the psychopaths are in charge. How did this happen? Well, this is uh, one example of how that happened. So the question really is up to us, okay, where do we go from here? I'm going to skip over this quickly because Danny already covered what a paradigm is. It's a set of... of Beliefs shared by members of a group. It's very powerful once it, it gets in. Uh, so, so now, and then it, for those who are ready, it's important to question that paradigm. So this is a, a, a Thrive adapted model of what's called the Nolan diagram that, uh, that I want you to look at for a minute, where on the, on the plane in the middle, it's really the political spectrum with liberal, Democrat, et cetera, on the left and conservative Republican on the right. What we've seen in history is that usually spirals down into the uh, authoritarian, totalitarian state. But there's another possibility that Mary was talking about this morning where it can actually spiral up, where you can actually begin to lift off the plane of authoritarian rule. So I want to ask you now to, uh, this may be, uh, you know, a social taboo. Uh, and if you're not comfortable with it, don't do it. Or just go ahead and do it and be uncomfortable. That's all right, too. I want to ask you to identify yourself. Uh, you don't have to stand up uh, and do it. But I want you to think to yourself, where am I on the political spectrum? And it would be helpful for me just in terms of percentages to see what kind of audience I'm talking to. Because for some reason, I'm still invited to, to conservative groups, to liberal groups, to libertarian groups. Uh, and... So it's, it's just very interesting and useful for me to see where people, where, where the belief systems are at. So um, I'm going to ask you to, to choose amongst these categories. First one is the, is the, the traditional um, plane of political beliefs. So uh, raise your hand if you consider yourself to be a communist. Okay. That's actually kind of startling because I, I, as I've pressed some people recently, they finally admitted to me, yeah, I guess I am a communist. Um, how about a socialist? Raise your hand if you're a socialist. Okay. A few more. A liberal. And you can be in more than one category if you want. Uh, a centrist. Yep. Okay. A few centrists. Uh, an independent. Okay. A lot, lot of independent thinkers here. Uh, and independent, in this sense, really means you, that you don't want to be tied down to a particular party. You want to be able to vote for any particular uh, leader uh, that you have confidence in. And it's still on the political spectrum, where someone is ruling over someone else. Someone has rights that you don't have, like to take other people's money or declare war, stuff like that. Um, and how many conservatives? Welcome to Iceland. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Uh, so now we start to live. The libertarian, have, have, uh, Mary did a break, breakdown of the history of that this morning, but libertarians were making some effort to lift off of this spectrum, but it's still in the, the realm of, like li political libertarians still want to have political power. They, and they want to shrink government and, you know, have a lot more freedom and so forth, but they still want themselves to be in charge. Thank you. Um, and so how many people consider themselves to be a political libertarian or a minarchist, you, that, that you believe in minimal rule, but you still be, believe in rule? Okay, just a handful. And voluntarist is like, uh, I don't use the term anarchist because people don't know what anarchist means. We've been trained to think that it just means you know, blood and chaos in the streets. Anarchy actually simply means no rulers. It doesn't mean no rules. Uh, so how many, uh, so I consider myself to be a voluntarist. I, I, I don't believe in voting for rulers. I, I don't think that there should be a state. I think there needs to be a transition, but I, I, I believe that we actually should have, each, each have exactly the same rights and freedoms. How many voluntarists are in the room? 
Oh, that's, that's encouraging, actually. Wow. I just came from a conference where, uh, where there were 600 uh, Liberty folks, probably 90% voluntarists and 10% uh, minarchists. There's a, a saying in the Liberty world, what's the difference between a minarchist and a voluntarist? And the answer is about six months. I want you to know that, uh, that this awareness that Mary was talking about this morning, this is rising all over the planet. The, the conference that I was at, uh, 600 people, it's doubling every year. And people are coming in from the left, they're coming in from the right, they're coming in from the consciousness, consciousness movement. And uh, in Brazil and Venezuela right now, there's a huge youth movement that's growing where people are catching on. This is uh, from one of their recent protests where they're saying less Marx, social, socialist uh, communism, more Mises, which is basically representing the, the voluntarist uh, point of view. And their young people are creating the, these uh, social media websites where they're finally making it cool to actually be in favor of absolutely complete individual rights and equal rights rather than a few people having the rule un under this myth that, that they're representing the people. Okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to flip through uh, a few of these. How many people here, are, uh, raise your hand if you are dependent on the government in some way through welfare, a job, a contract, or employment at a state-sponsored university, something like that. Raise your hand. Okay. That was maybe 10%. So this would be a little redundant with what Mary said because uh, you've already answered that question. But that's a really good one to, to ask your friends as well. But it kind of leads to this. Would you be in favor of putting me in jail if I didn't want to pay the taxes that I see going to war to the Federal Reserve, all this? If I, if I refuse to pay the taxes, would you be in support of me going to jail? Just raise your hand. I'd like to know. Okay. Well, wow. That... I, I like this group. <laughs> uh, my favorite uh, liberty philosopher, Steph Molyneux, he, he put it this way. He said, the greatest fight in the history of the world and the world of ideas is the fight to establish a universal morality. And he's written a book that I consider to be, I was asked this in an interview recently, uh, what do you think is the most important book on the planet? And I said, universally preferable behavior. And they thought it was going to be the Bible or the Koran or something. What, what the heck is that? The, the subtitle of universally preferable behavior is a rational proof of secular ethics. I think for the first time he has defined universal ethics without relying on belief in some uh, God that people don't agree on or re uh, relying on the state or on majority rule. It's actually consistent and universal for the first time. It's a challenging book. Um, it, it'll shake you to the core, but it'll also set you free. Highly recommend it. It's a Universally Preferable Behavior by Stefan Molyneux. Okay, I'm going to uh, go... Real, uh, Mary really covered this also, uh, that we're, we're taught as kindergartners not to lie, to, you know, to hit, to steal other people's stuff, but then we're supposed to give our money to the government, which turns around and does exactly that. Mary covered the non-aggression principle. This isn't a new idea. This idea goes back at least to Epicurus and the 300s. And I'm not going to go through these. The, these are all quotes going back centuries where people are identifying this natural law where, where no one should be able to initiate harm against someone else and everyone should have equal rights. So it goes on and on. Even Jefferson. Now, of course, there was a lot of passionate intent, but some conflicted behavior given that he was owning slaves at the time. Martin Luther King, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That's where we've come so far. We're heading in the right direction, but please, we're not there yet. We need to learn to stop justifying violating each other. And it, you look at the polarity that's in the, in the world right now, particularly in the U.S., but it's happening everywhere. This is what it was like. I've been studying the Spanish Civil War. This is exactly how it started. 
oh, it's just kind of uncomfortable socially to talk politics for a while, and then it gets intense, and then pretty soon, you know, in Spain, all of a sudden, brothers, you know, work colleagues were shooting each other and torturing each other over difference in political beliefs. Difference in political beliefs. Politics is the struggle to gain power over other people's lives, and we need to recognize that and not put up with it anymore. Okay, my time is up, so I'm just going to say I'll, I'll, I'll continue this in the workshop tomorrow. We're going to go into to success stories in history where this has been proven out again and again. I'm going to go into how it actually functions. Right? Because Mary did a great job of starting into the discussion. Like, yeah, but it's great, but how in the hell would it work? Well, when you've got independent insurance organizations, security organizations, dispute resolution organizations, all of a sudden you have a three-legged stool, you have a synergy that actually allows the whole thing to work. And every single person, like Danny was talking about this morning, every single person is individually accountable for their behavior, even in their businesses. So there's no state-sponsored corporation that's going to give you the protection from, from that kind of liability. How are we going to get from here to there? We laid it out in, uh, in Thrive, uh, in the three stages. Uh, I won't go into that now, but the, this is one of the most encouraging things to me. I probably spend five to six hours a day for the last 10 years studying this topic because to me, the, once I had the aha moment, I, need, I needed to understand how it would really work, not just be some Pollyanna philosophy. And what, what we're seeing is that injustice the over 90% of the court cases in America are already solved by independent mediators and, uh, and arbitrators. In security, there are more private police than there are public uh, you know, government police in the United States. Al alternative currencies are springing up like crazy. Peer-to-peer -peer markets, uh, more alternatives in education. In other words, it, this freedom is happening already because it aligns naturally with, with human uh, incentives and human morality. I don't expect you to read this, but we'll go over this in the, in the, in the workshop. Uh, I, made, I have an ongoing list of what goes away, the problems that seem intractable, but they all disappear when you get rid of the state. And then I'm writing a book on this right now, and I've, I've, I tried to wrap my mind around why do the conversations always get bogged down. And I've got uh, a list of 20 that I consider to be the major mind traps where the, the, where the conversation breaks down between people who are, you know, who are really good people but can't talk to each other respectfully long enough to actually get to the principles of freedom. In the workshop, we'll go over what those mind traps are. And I just want to leave you um, with a couple of images here. We, we really tend to think that the government has the power, and we laid out in, in Thrive that there's at least six levels above them but the, the, the authoritarian state only has the power because we give it to them. And as people are turning and walking away, that will disappear. And finally, uh, this quote from de Chardin, someday after mastering the winds, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And then for a second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. To me, the non-aggression principle is the foundation of love. It's the beginning of allowing people to be the way they are as long as they're not violating you uh, or anyone else. So this, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. I'm thrilled and convinced that this, this idea is the time has come. And I've been here for, on this planet for quite a while. This, to me, is the way out for humanity that I've been looking for my whole life. And in the workshop, we're going to look at the at compass and tools. We'll talk about how this stuff works. I want to entertain your questions. I know, I know you've got the same similar ones that I had when I was arguing with Trevor and then everyone else I could for you know, several years investigating this. And we'll, it, we'll, talk, we'll talk about current events. If you want to talk about the, the political situation, if you want to talk about the Dragon family, what's going on with the global currency reset and so forth, we can explore all that stuff. So finally, I'm going to end with... Uh, this is what it's going to be like. Imagine yourself in, in, in a world where we're all free to act as long as we don't do harm to others, where there are rules based on this ethic, but no rulers. Thank you very much.
Amazing. Thank you very much. Isn't this why we need our children and grandchildren here? I, I mean, if we look around and we see the constituency here at the, the conference, we are parents, grandparents. We got to start pulling in the young to, so they see the hope that is right on the doorstep. I mean, Foster's delivering it. And, and I want to be at the mailbox. <laughs> You're pulling it out. Thank you so much, brother. That's, yeah, that's awesome.